Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiangjun in Beijing, and in today's program, we are continuing with our major series about Chinese Kung Fu. Back in the 1970s, an actor named Li Xiaolong became a household name in China and around the world. You probably know him better as Bruce Lee. It was, of course, his Kung Fu movies that made him famous. But he did a great deal more to promote martial arts. For one thing, he developed a brand new system of martial arts called Jeet Kune Do. On top of that, he also set up a Kung Fu club in the city of Seattle. All in all, Bruce Lee can be credited with attracting worldwide attention to Chinese Kung Fu. And bear in mind, before he came along, the term Kung Fu wasn't even found in the average English dictionary. As for Jeet Kune Do, it was actually based on Yongchun Boxing, a major school of Nanchuan or Southern Style Boxing. Nanchuan is a general term for the various martial arts schools popular in areas south of the Yangtze River. Many viewers will already be familiar with this boxing style which features steady hand strikes with a sudden explosive force accompanied with short cries. Many of the earlier action movies made in Hong Kong feature this style. It is Southern Style Boxing, a style that is particularly popular in Southeast China. Jia Liang Liao, Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan are all masters of Southern Style Boxing. A rough estimate puts the number of Southern style boxing practitioners in China and abroad at several dozen million. Of the several major Chinese martial arts schools, Southern style boxing is the richest in form and the most complex in terms of theoretical principles. It also boasts the largest number of movement routines. Very few people know anything about the origins and early days of Southern style boxing. It is quite different, for example, from the Shaolin school, which has a clearly established line of inheritance. The Wudang and Urmei schools, meanwhile, have accomplished Buddhist or Taoist Kung Fu masters who can brag about their great teachers in the temples. Southern style boxing has none. The names and feats of the early southern style boxing masters are unknown even today. This fact naturally leads us to ask a number of questions. When did southern style boxing emerge? How did it develop its unique characteristics? And how did it evolve through its long history to the form we see today? Come with us now into the mysterious world of Southern style boxing. Southern style boxing is the common generic name given to various forms of martial arts practice in Southeast and South China, but especially those featuring boxing routines found in historical records from the Ming and Qing dynasties. People in Southeast China began to practice martial arts well before the Ming dynasty, but so far, no definite records have been found as to the time of its birth. According to history books, martial arts prospered in Southeast China for the first time during the Southern Song dynasty almost 900 years ago. After a nomadic tribe from northeast China overthrew the northern Song dynasty in the year 1127, Zhao Gou, who was a prince of the deposed northern Song dynasty, fled south of the Yangtze River to the town of Linan, present-day Hangzhou. There he established the southern Song dynasty with himself as emperor under the title Emperor Gaozong. Within a very short time, relatives of the royal family, court officials and noble families converged on the small town of Hangzhou and turned it into a political and cultural center in southeastern China. 
According to records written by scholars of that time, in Hangzhou there were many martial arts practitioners from all walks of life, aristocrats and common people alike, and martial arts societies were supported by court ministers. Members of these societies mainly practiced wrestling and archery, but on the outskirts of Hangzhou there were also a number of patrol societies composed mainly of young men from farmers' families. These young farmers tended the fields and practiced martial arts at the same time and carried out patrols with bows and swords in hand and they were always prepared to do battle. Soldiers from North China brought with them to Southeast China their martial arts skills and they would have a great influence on Southern style boxing. Han Shizhong, Liu Guangxu and Yue Fei, three of the four army commanders who helped revitalize the Southern Song Dynasty, came from the Central Plain. Many history books include comments on Yue Fei's martial arts skills. According to History of the Song Dynasty, Yue Fei, when still a teenager, could shoot arrows with both his hands in alternation and make every arrow hit the bullseye. We know that Yue Fei was born in Tangyin in Hunan province in the heartland of the Central Plain. Legend has it that his martial arts teacher Zhou Tong was a master of the Shaolin school of boxing. But whether this is true or not, he certainly taught UFA archery skills along with techniques for wielding the spear and cudgel. UFA was especially good with a spear. He displayed a style that was steady and powerful and which was greatly admired by martial arts practitioners of his time. During the Ming and Qing dynasties, Yue Fei's spear technique became very popular in what are known today as areas south of the Yangtze River, and it is said Yue Fei's skills were passed down by descendants of soldiers under his command who were stationed there. Some of the smooth and powerful moves of Yue Fei style spear technique can be found in Yue Fei style boxing, popular in Wuxia and Hubei province, and in parts of Guangdong province inhabited by people of the Hakka ethnic minority. In Linan, the capital of the Southern Song Dynasty, martial arts thrived, mostly because of the invasion of the Central Plain by tribes of the nomadic Qin people. A line from a poem written during that historical period describes the debauched lifestyle that could be seen in Linan at that time. When will the singing and dancing by West Lake end? Zhao Gao, or Emperor Gaozong of the Southern Song Dynasty, is known in Chinese history as a weak ruler who yielded to the unreasonable demands of an invading force. Very few people know he harbored a great desire to avenge the disgrace brought to his nation and restore to it the territory he had lost. In point of fact, the emperor was a martial arts master. Historical records reveal that Zhao Go was a fine archer who could draw a 55 kilogram bow and he could shoot well from on horseback. His martial arts skills were such that he easily fulfilled the army requirements of the Song Dynasty to serve in the Imperial Guard. Zhao Gao organized a wrestling battalion that was stationed in his palace. This special battalion had more than 100 members, all selected from among the country's top wrestlers. Every three years, the emperor would hold a competition and those who came out best were appointed officers of army units. In effect, the emperor was promoting martial arts and as a result, during the Southern Song Dynasty, martial arts went through a period of rapid development. There are distinct variations in the geography between China's north and south, as defined by the Yangtze River. These variations are reflected in the way people live and also in their martial arts. Chuan Chuan, or boat boxing, for example, is a typical southern style martial art. As the name suggests, it developed in the fishing communities of southern China. Despite the fact that martial arts styles from North China exerted a strong influence on those in Southeast China, a number of native boxing styles were preserved thanks to the particular geographic and historical conditions in the Southeast. This is Chuan Chuan or boat boxing, a style that is still popular in coastal areas of Jiangsu and Zhejiang provinces. 
Said to have been invented by a fisherwoman, boat boxing went by its unusual name simply because it was practiced only on boats. Boat boxing features steady footwork, little movement of the lower parts of the body and fist strikes close to the body. The emphasis is on attacks at close range and preemptive strikes. The book, An Account of Martial Arts in Zhejiang Province, published in the 1980s, carries a passage which reads, Fishermen in the provinces of Jiangsu and Zhejiang were often harassed by pirates. Fisherwomen were raped time and again. To protect themselves, the fisherwomen developed a special boxing style on the basis of their observation of sea turtles catching their prey and on their own experiences fighting back the pirates. The new boxing style was very suited to the limited amount of space on a boat. It seems then that this boxing style was first practiced by women, but that over time it assimilated more powerful striking techniques and became more suitable for male practitioners. Eventually, the boxing style changed from one for women to one for men, and from one practiced only on boats to one that was practiced on land as well. After the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, there was no longer any such trouble at sea and the original self-defense purpose of boat boxing disappeared. For quite some time, no one practiced boat boxing, but in recent years, dedicated martial arts enthusiasts have sifted through records and traced its history, and the style has been revived. Today, practitioners of this boxing style can be found in a number of areas in southeast China. Boat boxing places stress on the use of a stable squatting posture with the toes grasping the ground. Basically, there are no jumping movements and only a very few high leg kicking moves. The style also places stress on preemptive strikes and fighting at close quarters. Many boat boxing techniques are similar to those of modern southern style boxing, but the routines used in boat boxing are simpler and more primitive. For these reasons, boat boxing is no match for the martial arts of North China which utilize a great variety of routines. But was southern style boxing as practiced in the southern Song Dynasty anything like this? Definitely not. Many scholars living in the south of the Yangtze River passed the southern Song Dynasty's imperial examinations for civil service with flying colors. Around the year 1156, Emperor Gaozong of the Song Dynasty resumed the Imperial Martial Arts Examination for those wishing to take up army service, and he set up a martial arts school in Lin An for the training of army officers. He gave his new martial arts school the same status as the esteemed Imperial Academy, thus guaranteeing that those who passed the martial arts examination would enjoy great prestige. In a very short time, Lin An became the center for martial arts practitioners, but to everyone's surprise, Martial arts practitioners from North China did not show any great advantage in the imperial martial arts examinations. It was martial arts practitioners from a little backwater area south of the Yangtze River, known as Wenzhou, that made a name for themselves. In ancient times, Tangnan County in Wenzhou municipality was known as Pingyang County, and the county's residents have a long tradition of martial arts that stretches back to those times. Even today, locals can be seen gathering at ancestral temples or Buddhist temples to practice martial arts. Even now, a hot topic of conversation among the locals is the list of candidates from Tangnan County who were successful in the Imperial Martial Arts Examinations during the Southern Song Dynasty 900 years ago. Nansong Zonggong experienced 
，他提出了五个板眼、六个探花、一百二十四个五进士，这样出现了全全国少见的这个五进士扎堆的现象，也就是成了五进士之乡、五状元扎堆的这种现象，在全国好多地方是非常罕见的。But what was Sun and Style Boxing really like during the Southern Song Dynasty? Unfortunately, no boxing manuals from that time have made it down to the present day, but some of the boxing routines popular in Tang Nan County retain some of the moves. Local practitioners execute these moves according to a particular principle, and the routines have been passed down from one generation to another orally from the time of the Southern Song Dynasty 900 years ago. 在开始练的时候，我们开听门，就是把听目打开，也可以说眼睛瞪起来，把这个睫毛展开，是雕鹰也，引如老鹰四物，这显出威武。下地个就是木鱼嘴，那和尚桥的木鱼嘴，舌尖往上点，吞鹰超堵，起丹田，把自己丹田往上。一翻，就上压下提，身如铁桶。The Southern style boxing routines practiced in Tang Nan County today have been passed down along a family tree, and the names of the routines are seldom found in manuals of martial arts practiced in other parts of China. In ancient times, the area that makes up present-day Tang Nan County was cut off from the outside world. This is the reason why so many primitive martial arts forms have been so well preserved here. From them, we can learn something about the way southern style boxing was practiced in much earlier times. Along with Tang Nan County, known as the home of martial arts masters, the city of Lin An, which once served as the capital of the Southern Song Dynasty and is now the city of Hangzhou, and the town of Yongtai in Fuzhou, have produced many superb martial arts practitioners. The 1,000-year-old tradition of martial arts seen in these places testifies to the great vitality of southern-style boxing as it developed in the Southern Song Dynasty. When a nomadic people from northeast China conquered the Central Plain and founded the Yuan Dynasty, a dark age for martial arts in southeast China began. To consolidate its rule, the Yuan Imperial Court issued several decrees banning the practice of martial arts by the common people. A decree issued by Emperor Shizhu said, any civilian who carries iron weapons must be sent to the government and punished. A decree issued by Emperor Wu Zong said, no civilians are allowed to hunt with bows and other weapons. A decree issued by Emperor Ying Zong said, no civilians are allowed to hunt or practice martial arts with weapons. The Imperial Court forbade all civilians from owning any kind of weapons, and people caught with a weapon were jailed and in many cases beheaded. In more serious cases, an entire clan could be executed. In Southeast China, martial arts faced unprecedented suppression. This situation remained unchanged during the dynasty that replaced the Yuan dynasty, the Ming dynasty. Zhu Yuanzhang, the dynasty's founder, was originally little more than a man of leisure, and presuming, perhaps not without some cause, that the people would rise up against him, he adopted an overcautious approach toward the practice of martial arts. By the middle of the Ming dynasty, however, Japanese pirates were regularly carrying out raids along China's southeastern coast and this presented martial arts in Southeast China with the chance to thrive once again. By the mid-Ming dynasty, Japanese pirates were carrying out regular raids along China's southeast coast. The man who eventually succeeded in dealing with the problem was a general by the name of Qi Ji Guang. Well, his success has a lot to do with martial arts, which were flourishing in Southeast China at the time. During the reign of Emperor Jia Jing of the Ming Dynasty, the raids by the Japanese pirates on China's southeastern coast had become particularly fierce. But as well as the Japanese pirates, Chinese bandits were running rampant on the sea, looting everything they could and killing everyone they came across. 
Larger bands of Japanese pirates could rally more than 100 boats and 10,000 men to attack cities along the coast in the provinces of Zhejiang and Fujian, and they killed, burnt, raped and plundered at will. Martial arts skills mastered by civilians along the coast as good as they were, were simply not enough to fight back the ruthless Japanese pirates. Chi Ji Guang, an outstanding army commander from North China, was dispatched to fight the Japanese pirates, and he soon cramped their style. Chi Ji Guang was from a family of army commanders in Peng Lai and Shandong province, but he was not only a strategist, he was also a martial arts master. During the years he led the Chinese army in its fight against Japanese pirates along the southeastern coast, he wrote several books on military affairs and martial arts that are now regarded as masterpieces. Around the year 1560, Qi Ji Guang was transferred to Taizhou in Zhejiang province, where the raids by Japanese pirates were the most frequent and vicious. He knew well that his soldiers would be able to defeat the Japanese pirates only after they had mastered martial arts to a sufficient degree. And so, with this fact in mind, he wrote a combat manual in which he included the following. A student of boxing must use his body flexibly and keep the movements of his feet light but steady so that he can charge forward or retreat with ease and kick his legs high with force. When he has reached this point, he will be able to jump high and stand on his hands as he wishes, and his fist strikes will be fierce and fast. Chi Ji Guang came up with the tactics for his manual with the fighting style of the Japanese pirates in mind, namely that the Japanese kept jumping while striking. Although Chi Ji Guang came from the north, he went to considerable lengths to assimilate the best points of martial arts as practiced in the south. In a book on boxing technique, the name Liu Enzhu, an army commander from Taizhou, is mentioned twice. Liu came first in an imperial martial arts examination for army service and was known as a master of Liu family boxing, a boxing style which stressed a combination of attack and defense that has been passed down in the Liu family for generations. The principle of using continuous and fast strikes was adopted by Qi Ji Guang as the key point of his long boxing with 32 set patterns. In preparing this work, Qi drew diagrams of the moves he selected, added rhymes that explained them, and presented the result to his soldiers to use as a practice manual. He said, All martial arts practitioners must first learn fist positions before they can handle weapons such as the sword, spear, and cudgel well. Soldiers under the command of Qi Ji Guang, who were later demobilized, took the long boxing Qi had developed to areas along the southeast coast. Even today, the southern style boxing practiced in Taizhou retains some of the features of Qi's long boxing. As a military strategist, Qi Ji Guang was well aware of the limits of combat using only the hands and legs. In fact, at the very beginning of his manual Discipline and Efficiency Key Points on Boxing, Qi Ji Guang wrote, Boxing is useless in real combat. The reality was that Ming Dynasty soldiers fought with swords and spears and would never have been able to be victorious in a real battle using only their boxing skills. In one of his books, Qi Ji Guang made glowing remarks about Yu Dayo, a master of the cudgel and a famous army commander who fought the Japanese pirates in southern Fujian province. As the commander of hundreds of thousands of soldiers, Yu Dayo emanated the character of the lone chivalrous man, and his contribution to the development of martial arts in southeast China during the Ming Dynasty was enormous. Some of the remarkable martial arts skills he utilized had been passed down to him through a branch of the royal family of the Song Kingdom that had ruled the southern part of Fujian province hundreds of years before. Later, he learned Shaolin-style cudgel, and he became the greatest master of the cudgel of his era. Even martial arts masters of Shaolin Temple regarded the cudgel skills of Yu Dayo as the real thing. The key to lasting success, as far as a martial arts school is concerned, is its openness. In other words, its willingness to absorb the finest skills from other schools. 
Qi Ji Guang provides a good example of this. He came from the north, but by adopting the best elements of southern style martial arts, he was able to create the highly effective long boxing. On the other hand, there was Yu Da Yo, a martial art master from the south. He developed a school of martial arts that incorporated the Kajo techniques made famous at Shaolin in the north. Well, you'll hear more about Yudayo in our next program. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. Tune in again next time for more about Southern-style boxing. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. Goodbye.